From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. And in today's lineup, K-State's Ignacio C.M. Pitti, offering considerations on planting soybeans and grain sorghum this deep into summer. He looks at adjusting seeding rates and row spacing to compensate for the late planting date. And Ignacio talks about whether going with shorter season varieties and hybrids is necessary for timely crop maturity. He'll be followed by K-State's Jeff Whitworth. We'll talk about controlling several insect pests now at work in Kansas soybean stands. He'll also discuss the expected duration of insecticide seed treatments against these pests. And later on, on this week's K-State Horticulture segment, Dennis Patton will talk about harvesting and storing those garden potatoes and onions. Right here on Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. Glad to have you aboard once again for another Agriculture Today. Well, it's been a trying planting season as we've documented time and again here on the broadcast for you row crop growers. And in fact, several of you are still eyeing the prospect of late planting either grain sorghum or soybeans. And there are some things to give due consideration to in either case as we bring back by now crop production and cropping systems specialist Ignacio C.M. Pitti of K-State Research and Extension. Well, Ignacio, the clock is ticking here on both of those crops, perhaps more so for soybeans than for grain sorghum. But in either case, we're getting very, very late in the going here. Yeah, as always, Eric, thanks for the invitation. I think that we have different concerns at this moment. It's not only that we are getting late. And the question at the end of the day is probably the million-dollar question is what type of fall are we planning to get? Right. Because I think that the... Today, we can make recommendations based on our experience and knowledge, based on data, but can we finish those crops? Right. So on the soybean side, when we're looking at, at late planting conditions, again, one of the main challenges, and, and even more this year, is not, at this point, it's not connected to water. <laughs> no, not at all. Okay? Or lack of water. Or lack <laughs> of water. Yeah, we probably be saying that we are on the other side, right. the extreme of having way too much water. But... The question is the duration of the growing season. We will have enough days for that crop to be fully mature at harvest. And I think that then some of the few decisions that we can take is on soybeans when we are planting late. Our research shows not much extreme difference when we are looking at a full maturity. I mean, in some situations where we are using group fours compared with a short group. I mean, in some situations we are not seeing so much difference. I would say in many situations... Keep, if possible, the maturity group. We are not seeing too much difference on maturity groups. One of the things that we recommended at this time of the year is to think about narrowing row spacing, trying to really compensate for this lack of, of really good temperature and sunny days. I mean, that is basically not helping that crop to, to grow and fast as straight as it should be at this time of the year. And then basically that narrowing row spacing helps, I mean, that crop to, to sense each other, to compete and to grow faster. Second one is compensating for seeding rate. We know we have enough data information showing that uh, depending what is your optimal seeding rate for early planting, if you are shooting for 110,000 seeds per acre on soybeans, uh, bumping up the seeding rates 10-15% when you are planting late is not a valid idea. These plants will have less time during the season, so they will have less time to branch, produce branches, and then most likely you will get less yield coming from branches. So the only way to compensate is to make sure that you have more stems, more main stems. And the only way to make sure that we that could happen is to add more plants. So that's another strategy of looking at, at these conditions. Then a starter fertilizer, I mean, we have a few discussions with Dorivar. And then also, I mean, I think that there are some situations that it could help. I mean, if you want to just to imp improve that germination and emergence and make sure that those plants are coming 
faster. I mean, sometimes there are not really a big difference, large difference in yields, but perception-wise, I think that we are seeing improving that emergence and, and the quality of the stands. And then that's another question to, that we can discuss more, stand quality. I mean, planting to wet, planting in the wrong soil conditions, I mean, and then soybeans is a crop that is very susceptible to early season compaction. Even if, just is, if, if it's a fine layer of, of crusting and compaction, I mean, we are seeing a lot of issues in multiple fees. And then in wet conditions, we, we already experienced this really sidewall compaction. I just came back from visiting fields, and we have in some places, I mean, 50% of lack of seeds. I mean, basically, big, big problems for germination and emergence. So, that is dramatic. Yeah, yeah. And in some places, I mean, it was because a downforce of the planter on too much pressure, I mean, the seed contact with the soil on really in compacted conditions. Those seeds, I mean, when you start digging, it was not a problem of not delivering the seed. It's a problem that the seeds are there, but they are not coming up. Problems are plenty, obviously. A lot of issues, I mean, yeah. <laughs> when you speak of hiking that seeding rate for soybeans, how much to bump that up? Yeah, and I usually try to provide perspective of, of thinking. I mean, if the producer is already on the high end, and when I'm saying high end, is I, I see some guys working on 140,000, and I think that they are on the high end, at least from my perception. When I'm seeing guys working on 100,000 seats, I will say those are the ones that maybe they can see more, a little more benefit on, on bumping up 10, 15 percent on the seeing rates. So that 10, 15 percent increase on seeing rate, it also needs to be connected to what is the, the current seeing rate that the farmer is utilizing. If you are on the, on the upper section, I will say stay there, don't do any cuts. If you are on the more lower section, Hundred or ninety thousand seeds, we might need to be up. Uh, I mean, at least to get one hundred and ten, one hundred and twenty thousand seeds, and make sure we can get a hundred thousand or more if possible, because we are really late in the season, and those more plants will be helping us to compensate. But once more, by and large, you'd like to see the soybean growers stay with their original variety maturity selection. Yeah, I think that we are not seeing, based on our research, I mean, in fact, sometimes we will always discuss on cutting back on maturity and, and seeing if we can, but our research doesn't show too much effects on really cutting too much. I mean, if you if you cut, you need to really cut, I mean, not just, I mean, half a point of maturity. So you need to really go to a, the, a the other extreme. I mean, if you go to the other extreme of being too short, then you will, be, if you have good growing conditions, I mean, an extended fall, you are leaving a lot of yield on the table. Right. Similar things, I mean, if we move to now from soybeans, I mean, now going into sorghum. Right. Uh, Same principles apply for the most part, although, again, we're not so ultra late on sorghum as we are with soybeans. Exactly. We're not on the ultra late, but, I mean, you know, as always, on sorghum, we're always concerned about the flowering and trying to think about when as is the flowering end, is, is ending, and then from there I start calculating, okay, when will be the more or less the optimal time for for finishing that crop. And then on sorghum is pretty similar. I mean, in fact, uh, some research information shows that when you are delaying your planting date, you, that yield composition that usually for an early, early planting sorghum comes from the main head and the tillers. Usually when you're planting late, the tiller contribution on yield is minimum. Again, similar concept on soybeans we discuss about branches. On sorghum we discuss about tillers. Very minimum tiller contribution, and then in those cases, you really depend on the number of plants that you that you put in the field. So for some of these guys, I mean, planting this week, next week, think about, I mean, uh, potential I mean, adjustments on seeing rates, because the number of heads will most likely will come from many plants with few tillers, very few tillers at this time of the year, and then they will come basically with plants that will have, I mean, most of the yield constructed from one single head. So that's one of the adjustments. I mean, and again, our research doesn't show much depending on the yield environment that you are. So if you are in 150 bushels, even with 40,000 plants, we are extremely well. If you are not trying to shoot for high yields, we might need to start moving up on seeing rates. If you are in a dryland environment, then we need to cut back. And then some guys, I mean, talking about 20,000, I mean, usually my idea is always to if I'm going too late or I'm going at this time of the year, is thinking about at least to increase seeing rate in a similar fashion, maybe 10, 15 percent to what is my normal current seeing rate to make sure to compensate for the lack of days. 
I mean, exactly the same concept. 15 in, um, versus 30 inch row spacing, our data doesn't show tremendous benefit when you're using 15s or when you're using 30 inch. My recommendation is usually similar as we discussed on soybeans, maybe not big benefit on yields, but benefits connected to increasing competition and basically more importantly for sorghum is weed control. Crowding those weeds out as best as you can. Exactly. We have, I mean, the first 30, 35 days of uh, that plant that it can be outcompeted by weeds. Uh, in terms of maturity, we, we discuss also with multiple farmers in the last couple of weeks. I would say something very similar, but in sorghum it probably makes some sense to start looking at medium maturity. And then if we go way too late and if we are talking about July, then we need to start thinking about, I mean, cutting maturity because our problem will be to place that flowering too late in August or even entering into September. And then we'll have in many, depending on the region of what part of the state. But if you are going in north central or northwest, we will have a lot of issues to finish, to finish that crop. Especially so if the forecast holds for a cooler than normal summer where those growing degree units do not build up sufficiently. Uh, and I think that the farmers are very concerned about seeing that sorghum is moving really slow. And the question that they have is, should I just go ahead and then cut more on maturity, anticipating that I don't see many growing degree days in, in the next coming two weeks? But things can change quite quickly and very rapidly. So we can go from next two weeks, it looks like we will be in 80s and 95s, maybe close to the second week of July, but we can go very quickly, I mean, to hundreds right. in a rush. A producer simply makes the best judgments possible based on the data from the research and the weather expectations, and we appreciate the input, Ignacio. We've so much more going on, though, that we want you back tomorrow to troubleshoot those row crops that were planted earlier. We'll cover all of that with you right here on the broadcast tomorrow. Many thanks to you. Thanks. Ignacio C.M. Pitti on late planting of soybeans and grain sorghum, crop production and cropping systems specialist with K-State Research and Extension. You're tuned to Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. We're back now on Agriculture Today and with a report on insects as they might be active now in soybean stands around Kansas. Our guest now is getting the word on that from growers and is looking into what is going on out there. Jeff Whitworth, of course, is a crop entomologist with K-State Research and Extension. And as a matter of fact, Jeff, you have quite a lineup of pests that might be found in soybean stands right now. And it seems to be an unusually long roster here. <laughs> Well, that's right. I have gotten a lot of calls in the, probably the last week or two. We are starting to see some pretty good growth on some of the soybeans. Others have not yet been able to plant, and I've gotten quite a few calls about that. First of all, in the last week or two, I've gotten several calls, and I've seen several plants that have been infested with thistle caterpillars. Now, that's a pest that we don't normally talk about frequently. The thistle caterpillar is a migratory butterfly called the painted lady. Uh, that's the adult. The painted lady migrates in into Kansas every year in the spring and then migrates back out in the fall. At least always has. But in the meantime, when they come in, they start laying eggs. What we have been seeing in the last two to three weeks are the thistle caterpillars from that first generation painted ladies that migrated in from the southern part of the United States. So in my opinion, from what I've seen the last few years, there's a pretty healthy population already for this first generation. From what we normally see, this is still going to be a springboard generation or a springboard population into the next generation, and then even possibly the next generation after that, because thistle caterpillars Again, depending upon the weather, there'll be two or three generations or more in Kansas, 
and primarily that they can affect other plants, but primarily what we have a problem with is the soybean plant. Now, they can get into sunflowers later on, and that's a lot of times that's they have more of a problem in sunflowers because, like I said, by then, by the time the sunflowers come up, it's a little later in the year. It's probably the second or third generation where there's a few more individuals around. But so far this year, we've had pretty good population for first-generation thistle caterpillars. So what that means, and, and there's not that many in my opinion, or that I've seen or heard about, there are not that many beneficials or natural enemies that are going to help regulate the thistle caterpillar. When the eggs, they're laid on the leaves of the, of the soybean plants, then as the larvae hatches out, it will take webbing and kind of cover itself, pull the sides of the leaves in. So they're really in a pretty well-protected little cell. And within that cell, then, they will feed on the leaf tissue, and as they get bigger, they will broaden that cell and include more leaf tissue. So generally speaking, each caterpillar is is not that well seen or highly visible because they're covered by leaves, so growers don't really notice it uh, until the second or third generation when you have a lot of that going on. So they, they can do some damage. Also, if you do decide to treat, Again, you got to remember, I just said, they're pretty well protected inside this little cell of leaf tissue and webbing. So if you do decide that it's reached a treatment threshold, you're probably, you have to have enough liquid carrier and enough pressure to get through that barrier to get to where the caterpillar is itself because these are contact insecticides. Usually they don't build up into that density that we have to treat. But like I said, this year, so far, we've seen a few more. So right now, they're going to kind of be on hiatus, which means the caterpillars are pretty much are pupating right now. So they're in the soil. So where you're going to see a bunch of painted lady butterflies flying around mating, then they're going to lay eggs in about two more weeks, you're going to start seeing more of this leaf tissue incorporated. And as these late, later planted soybeans come up, they're probably going to be even more highly visible because they're going to be, uh, there's not going to be as much foliage for the caterpillars to feed on. So just keep that in mind that thistle caterpillars, there's been quite a few of them so far, and they're not going to go away. I mean, like I said, there aren't any natural enemies that I know of that are really going to impact or help control them. So th- the springboard generation, there's going to be more in the next month, and then there's going to be more after that, mm-hmm. uh, affecting at least the later plant of beans especially, or if we ever do get the wheat out of the ground, double crop soybeans. So be on the alert, growers, for thistle caterpillars, and perhaps at the same time, look for signs, you say, of webworm activity in soybeans, Jeff? Yes, we've also gotten several calls about uh, webworms. They're either called the alfalfa webworm or the garden webworm. It's the same insect. They're a little bit smaller, and they're not as thistly as the thistle caterpillar, uh, but they do webbing also, and they'll kind of hang together in a group. But they can be in alfalfa, or they can be in soybeans. An established uh, standard of alfalfa, they're probably not going to do much damage, but there's been enough of them this year that I've seen some pretty well mowed early season alfalfa that was just planted last fall because of the webworms. So if there's garden webworms or if there are uh, alfalfa webworms and they're in the soybeans, they're going to be adding to the defoliation as the thistle caterpillar is. So they're going to, uh, oh, probably back seven or eight years ago, the webworms started in the southeastern part of the the state. They moved all the way across the state, causing uh, a lot of applications of insecticides because Once they come in, they can defoliate these plants pretty quickly. The nice thing about soybean plants, they're very resilient, especially early on during the vegetative stages. They put on new tissue pretty quickly, overcoming any damage because – once it gets up to 60%, they're not going to. It's going to actually impact yield. But until you get up to you know, 50%, maybe up to 60% in the vegetative stages, up until it gets to the first reproductive stages, we've had plots that have had that much defoliation. You go out and you spray them, clean them up, and two weeks later you can't even tell which ones were infested and which ones weren't. So soybeans are very resilient at overcoming this kind of damage. But just the caterpillars and the webworms are really, for this time of year, they're really pretty common, and, and we're seeing more of them than we usually see. 
I would probably attribute that to a little cooler, uh, more human conditions we've had, but I've not seen any data to that effect. But, you know, that's probably why we're seeing so many of them right now. And there's yet one more down the list, the bean leaf beetle, which we've spoken about many seasons before, and it is back, you say. The bean leaf beetle is our number one soybean pest across the soybean belt in the United States. Mm -hmm. What happens, they overwinter as adults. They'll be in the alfalfa until they detect early planted or germinating soybeans, and they are fantastic at finding germinating soybeans from a long distance. So once they find the first fields, they all fly there, migrate in, and they start defoliating or eating uh, round or oval holes in the leaves of these plants. And, of course, they're highly visible. That gets everybody all excited. Uh, This year, because we haven't had too many be able to plant soybeans, the bean leaf beetle populations have seemed to be a little greater than in past years, and I think probably is because the beans are more concentrated just because of the moist conditions or the the, the wet conditions we haven't been able to plant. In any case, what is going to happen, these bean leaf beetle adults now pretty much have ceased feeding on the leaves, and they're going around laying eggs. So the eggs will hatch on the base of the plants around the stems, those little larvae will, will hatch out and they'll start feeding on the roots or the root hairs uh, of the soybean plants. And they'll come out and there'll be another generation. And that's the generation generally that will start feeding. They will feed on some leaf tissue, but primarily they'll feed on the pods. Uh, and that's the generation that can actually do quite a bit of yield reducing because they're feeding right on the marketable product. The pod itself and the and the seed inside the pod then gets desiccated or, you know, dries out or falls out or something else. So the adults we're seeing right now, yeah, they can cause some defoliation, but primarily, again, it's another springboard generation to build up for uh, another, what, 30 days or so or, or longer when you're starting to see more adults the adult bean leaf beetle then will continue to feed and continue to lay eggs clear up through August um, or September or whatever the season allows and continue to cause problems feeding on the pods themselves. Mm-hmm. Well, Jeff, for efficiency's sake, a producer would want to try likely to knock out as many of these, if not all of these, at the same time with a single treatment. Is that accomplishable? Uh, yes. One of the questions I've been getting also, because of the late planted soybeans or the possibility of, you know, actually planting after wheat, a lot of growers are contemplating using insecticide seed treatments. Mm-hmm. This year, because of bean leaf beetles, seed treatments are pretty effective on helping to control bean leaf beetles. So if you're planting late, if you haven't planted yet, knowing there's bean leaf beetles around, it might not be a bad idea to use an insecticide on your soybean seeds when normally I, we do, usually don't recommend that just because it's not needed, not because it doesn't work. But the seed treatments, they won't work on the thistle caterpillars and they won't work on the uh, webworms. They don't work too much on the lepidopterans, the worms uh, themselves. But the seed treatments still work pretty well on the bean leaf beetle larvae and adults. That's a consideration. Jeff, we always appreciate the update. We'll have you back soon. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Eric. Crop entomologist, K-State Research and Extension, Jeff Whitworth, briefing us on those pests that you soybean growers should be paying attention to right now at this stage of the growing season. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org.
This is the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. And moving on now to today's agricultural news headlines for you. These courtesy in part of DTN. Members of a working group appointed by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi met earlier this week with U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer to discuss the drug pricing provisions in the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement. Ways and Means Trade Chairman L. Blumenauer uh, said that Congress should be able to ratify the USMCA by the end of the year. While issues important to Democrats must be addressed, he said he recognizes that Mexico's newly elected president, and that country will suffer if the U.S. takes too long to improve the USMCA. Meanwhile, a group of Democratic lawmakers laid out their demands for supporting the agreement. That would include the reinstatement of mandatory country of origin labeling, something that few expect will happen. Billions of dollars worth of China-made goods subject to tariffs by the Trump administration in its trade fight with Beijing are dodging the China levies by entering the U.S. via other countries in Asia, especially Vietnam. That's according to the trade data and overseas officials. The Trump administration has, for more than a year now, sought to weed out the practice known as transshipment, in which Chinese exports typically are minimally processed or altered during a brief stop in a third port and then re-exported as a product originating from that third port. Such circumvention threatens to crimp U.S. plans as it prepares to add tariffs onto $300 billion of Chinese exports, essentially covering all of its China trade. The U.S., as you know already, has placed 25 percent tariffs on some $200 billion of Chinese exports. In the first five months of this year, exports to Vietnam from China of various equipment and electronics electronics have sharply increased compared with a year earlier. In turn, so have exports of such goods from Vietnam to the U.S. That's according to Vietnamese trade data. Now, Vietnam's customs agency said this month it has instructed its provisional and municipal branches to step up inspection and verification of certificates of origin. The regulator said that the companies had been importing Chinese goods, replacing the label to say made in Vietnam, then re-exporting the goods to the U.S., to Europe, or Japan. A spokesperson for the U.S. Customs and Border Protection said it has identified illegal transshipment of Chinese goods through several countries, pointing to cases in recent months in Vietnam, Malaysia, and the Philippines. She said the agency will continue to pursue such evasion. And U.S. Senator Debbie Stabenow, the ranking member of the U.S. Agriculture Committee, Senate Committee, that is, raised strong concerns that the reported suppression of significant climate change research at the USDA is harmful to agriculture and urged the department to publicize past and future research. A political article uh, published earlier this week reported a number of instances where USDA leadership downplayed the public release of several studies containing significant findings relating to climate change's effects on agriculture. In a letter to USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue, Stabenow expressed strong concerns that stifling research on climate change would have a negative effect on farmers and the agricultural economy. She requested a thorough explanation of the decision not to publicize the research project described in the article. She also urged that the USDA publicize all agency research relating to climate change that has been compiled since January of 2017 and asked the department to publicize any future studies involving climate change research in accordance with standard practice prior to the year 2017. And the U.S. Justice Department has launched a criminal investigation now into allegations that top poultry processors colluded to keep prices artificially high. The probe came to light after federal attorneys sought to intervene in a long-running lawsuit in which customers accused chicken processors, including Tyson, Pilgrim's Pride, Sanderson Farms, and Purdue Farms, of illegally cooperating. The processors have denied the allegations. The government asked a federal judge in Illinois to halt evidence collection in the suit for six months to protect a grand jury investigation into the matter. Lawyers from the department wrote that in a motion filed last week in Chicago. A ruling on that motion is expected today. On we go now to this week's edition of the Kansas Soybean Update, and awaiting with that is Greg Akagi. Greg? 
Donnell Rehagen, CEO of the National Biodiesel Board, joins us. And Donnell, NBB personnel and board members have been busy recently being in Washington, D.C. to discuss issues that are important to the industry. One of those issues would, of course, be the biodiesel tax incentive. Of course, it's a very critical issue for our industry. And so we had a record number of our members that attended our meetings in D.C. and a record number of visits on Capitol Hill. In fact, over 120 visits uh, with members of Congress talking about tax credit, among other other things. And it's so important for the health of the industry. You know, that tax incentive has been in place since 2005. So not only has the biodiesel producers gotten used to having that tax credit, but so have all their downstream partners, those who move the fuel out to the retail sites. And that tax incentive has been shared among all of those parties. And so with the expectation that it was eventually coming back. That's been the case even over 2018 and now into 2019. So it's been a long time that a bunch of folks in that supply chain, including our biodiesel producers, have been expecting that tax credit. So it's starting to put a real crimp in the cash flow and working capital. And so uh, things need to move and things need to move very quickly. Another issue is associated with the renewable fuel standard, but specifically looking at uh, small refinery exemptions on the RFS. We've been saying for a long time the tax credit's important, uh, the RFS is very important to our industry, but these small refinery exemptions are sort of that rock in your shoe. It just uh, always continues to be a problem, especially over the last couple of years as they've increased the number of those small refinery exemptions that they're granting and the volume. We've measured just directly attributable to biodiesel that over 360 million gallons have been lost of biodiesel demand over the last couple of years. And I think Scott Irwin, professor from University University of Illinois suggests that if this continues, our industry would lose well over a billion gallons of demand being destroyed by the small refinery exemptions in the next couple of years. Yeah, and that's gallons that you can't get back, unfortunately. Our biomass-based diesel volumes are set 18 months in advance. There's a reason for that. It's so that the industry can plan accordingly and you know, feedstock acquisitions and plant production and all of that. So when that number is set and then six months, eight months, 10 months into that year, those numbers are reversed because of these exemptions being granted, uh, many times retroactively, as we've been seeing. You can imagine how upsetting that is to the marketplace. Donnell Rehagen, CEO of the National Biodiesel Board, has joined us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Greg Akagi there. Thanks, Greg. And this is Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. Next up for you on this Agriculture Today, the weekly K-State horticulture segment and home vegetable gardeners, those of you who planted early and succeeded in starting off your potato and onion crops, well, those, if all has gone reasonably well, should be approaching harvest ready now. And so we'll offer some thoughts on harvesting and storage of those two highly popular vegetable crops. Dennis Patton is with us once again. As you know, Dennis is the Johnson County Extension Horticultural Agent. And with the wet weather, it was a bit of a slow start for both of those particular vegetables, Dennis, but they uh, have likely come on pretty well, have they not? That's right. You know, as a vegetable gardener at home myself, I tried hard to get my potatoes in on that old St. Patrick's Day, uh, March 17th. You know, I succeeded, but I know a lot of people got them in late. Same with onions, because it just seemed like it, obviously, well, it still hasn't stopped raining, seems mm. like, and here it is, harvest time. So, uh, yes, uh, those are some very popular vegetables for our home gardens. Well, let's take them independently, if we might. Okay. Potatoes, how does one know for sure, because obviously the end product is underground, how does one know if they're ready for digging? 
Well, you know, I think there's a couple ways to do that. A lot of gardeners, you know, cannot wait to resist. So I know a lot of people will get down there with their little trowels or shovels. And maybe even earlier than this, back in May, they'll start digging around, maybe pulling off a few new potatoes to, to eat and just see how they're progressing. Uh, and so that's one way. But the way you really tell when your potatoes are ready to be harvested is to look at the vines. And when the vines are dying out, you know, halfway turning yellow, uh, starting to wither, that's a good indication that that plant's put all the energy it's going to into those tubers, and it's time to dig your crop. Now, will all plants decay at the same rate? No. You know, depending on water, temperature, those type of things, they may not all wither at the same time. Also, variety is going to have a little bit difference in it also. But that's kind of why I use that guideline about half, you know, when they're just starting to kind of poop out, so to speak, which I know is a very professional term. <laughs> but <laughs> they even go from that nice green to that more off yellow green. That's also a good time to dig. And, and especially with those wettest soils we've had this year, you know, we can get into some problems with maybe those tubers starting to rot, those type of things. So I think this may be a year you want to maybe start digging a little bit early as opposed to waiting longer uh, to see if we, you know, try to avoid any rotting potatoes or those type of things if we're in some wet soil conditions. And any sage advice on actually digging those without uh, injuring those buds? Well, you know, the the spud itself should be growing right along that stem of the potato, but a lot of times they will send out a, a tuber maybe four or five, six inches from the base of the plant. So my advice would be two. One would be dig far enough away that you're pretty sure you're not going to slice into a potato. The other thing, you use the old spading fork. So instead of having a shovel, you've got the four tines that's less likely to hit a fork and then rock that plant out of the ground itself. Um, but yeah, you know, no matter how hard you try, it just isn't potato harvest without slicing a few. Okay. And of course, those you eat, just eat first. You okay. know, they, they become the casualties of war and uh, you go ahead and wash them off, peel them up, and um, you get the them. Well, those that you don't slice, that you actually dig intact successfully, how about storing those potatoes? What's required to give them a long shelf life? So after you dig them, you want to remove as much of the soil as possible. Now, keep in mind, if they're a new potato, that skin's not going to be set. It's going to slough off very easily. So just be careful not to bruise them, damage that skin. And then probably leave them, you know, not in sunlight, but in a shady area, maybe in your garage or somewhere for maybe a week, 10 days to let that soil dry off, let that skin set. And then after that, you want to store them cool and dry. So in the old days, that was down in the root cellar or your tornado shelter cellar um, on a lot of farmsteads have today. For most of us city dwellers, that's probably our, the coolest location in our basement. And does one need to spread those out right away in at least the temporary storage before moving them to the permanent uh, storage site to let them breathe, so to say? Or can you leave them in your bucket or whatever you've collected them in? Great question. Uh, after you dig them, I would probably spread them fairly thin to let them kind of here again harden off, dry out a little bit, get some of that excess moisture out of them. Then when you get to do the more permanent storage, you could maybe store them maybe oh, four, five, six inches deep, uh, depending on how much aeration is around them. You want some airflow so they don't rot and decay. So I wouldn't leave them like in my five-gallon bucket, those type of things, because I think you will get some rot and decay at the bottom. So you want good airflow around them to keep them, you know, on the dry side, not where they're going to get really humid and start the rot. All right, then. Well, let's turn then to onion harvest and mm -hmm. basically the same line of questions here, Dennis. When are those ready for digging? You know, kind of the same parameters as the potatoes. When the onions are mature, uh, a lot of times, depending on whether they're a plant or a seed onion that you plant in the ground, a lot of the stalks, the stems will break over. And so the rule of thumb is when maybe about half or a third or so of the stalks have kind of started to fall over, here again, wither. Uh, that's a good indication that here again, that onions made all the energy, all the food. It's not going to size up anymore. And that's a good time to go ahead and pull them and get them out of the ground. What about the storage guidelines for onions? Would those differ from those for potatoes? Almost identical. So here again, once you pull the onions, you've got a lot of moisture a lot of times in some of those necks. So here again, you can put them in a, in a warmer location for a week to two weeks to dry down some of that moisture out of those, uh, the necks, the tops, I guess, would be a better way to describe it to people. Uh, once those are dried up, then you can either cut those tops off. So all you have is like the onion you buy in the store, or what a lot of people do will 
pull together five, six of those uh, onions with the top attached, and then they'll just put a rubber band around them, a piece of twine around them, and then they'll hang them here again in their basement, in their cellar, or here again, they'll store them loosely in some sort of container that has good airflow around them. And uh, they should keep, you know, depending on, on the variety of the type of onion, they should keep for several months like the potatoes. Mm-hmm. But a cool and dry location is what you're looking for there. Cool and dry. And then, of course, on both of these root crops, it's always good as you're picking and using to just to sort through them. If you've got some ones that are rotting or sprouting, you go ahead and use those. Uh, a lot of times the onions will sprout on you and you're not ready to use that many, so you can chop those, put them in the freezer, and have those for your winter soups and stews or seasoning. Once again, though, and with the prospect of more rainfall in the forecast here in the coming weeks, one might want to take a look at the state of their garden potatoes and onions and determine whether they are harvest ready. And if they're close, you might want to move forward and and reap your benefits from your gardening efforts there. Dennis, thank you, as always, and we'll talk again soon. Thank you. Appreciate it. Dennis Patton is the Johnson County Extension Horticultural Agent, offering those guidelines on harvesting garden potatoes and onions on this week's K-State Horticulture segment. Well, our time's away once again. As always, thanks for tuning in, and please rejoin us right here tomorrow. Until then, Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.